Name something you're low-key good at outside of work. I guess like like home construction. Like I I I I uh I guess maybe you can see my I like this door. Did you um, break a cup? Did that um, just happen too? Maybe a va maybe a vase. <laughs> 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 but I can fix it, you see? Yeah. That's oh. all right. Hello, and welcome to Talking Too Loud with Chris Savage. I am your host, Chris Savage. I am joined by the one, the truly only, Sylvie Lubau. Sylvie, what's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? Have we done that before? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. fine. <laughs> we Oops. Definitely have. Oh, we'll do that again. We'll it's fix okay. it in post. We'll fix it in post. We have a great guest today. Jeff Charles is here, who is the VP of product at Ramp. They're the fastest growing SaaS company of all time. Um, he leads product management operations and their support teams. Um, he's been working in financial services for over a decade across B2B and B2C. Really great episode. Got in there on what it takes to grow fast, what product market fit looks like, how you should interact with the folks around you, delegate, alignment, working with CEOs, all lots of really meaty good stuff, especially from someone who's sitting there in this incredibly fast growing environment. So it was a really great interview coming up for you in a little bit. Phenom. Yeah. Phenom. Yeah. Yeah. Look <laughs> at us. Here we are. Sylvie, what's going on? What's got you talking too loud? Well, it's funny because Jeff kind of alluded to it, um, but the New York City Marathon, it is my favorite day of the year. It is a day where I is that lose true? my, oh, has been for a long time. Ask I, any of my friends. It's really favorite, your favorite day. It's like my this favorite day. day. Yeah. New York City Marathon Day. Okay. I get very loud at the marathon. I, I come up with cheers. There are some things you really shouldn't say. But you say them. No. No, like you, you don't want to say like. <laughs> it's like you, what are you talking about? You never want to say like. Say. You never want to say like you're almost there. Like that's not helpful. Okay. Uh, okay, like just pull it together. Like it's like yeah. another six miles. Like right. come on, that's terrible. You never yeah. want to say that. You always want to remind them they're looking good. They're you're looking, looking strong. Good. Yeah, you're looking. But you you scream it. Yeah. Looking good, runners. Did you, did you Looking see strong. <laughs> like did that. You, did you see anyone that you know? Um, did I wasn't tracking anybody this year, which is always a little bit of a bummer. Yeah. But I did. I saw someone running who had. She was clearly like running in memory of someone. Because mm. um, there was like a photo on the back of her shirt. And I ended up tracking her. So it was really cool to see when she finished. Like I felt oh, very wow. moved by. So her by story. Her. Yeah, I mean. It, it got your attention. It did. She broke through a literal crowd, got your attention. You subscribed to her. Yeah, I did. You followed her journey. I did. Wow. Great it, marketing. Great, great marketing. marketing. Um, did, you see, did you see our friend Walter Chen? He was running. What? Walter was running? You didn't tell me? Yeah. Actually. It, yes, that's. I guess I didn't tell you. Yes. Congrats, Walter. Yes. Proud of you. Yeah. He's he did looking it. good, looking he strong. Did it again, yeah. Well, that's what has me talking too loud. What has you talking too loud, friend? Well, um, speaking of Walter, last week I hung out with him. I hung out with talking too loud guest, early guest Nick Francis. I talked mm. to talking too loud guest uh, Colin Niedercorn. Colin Niedercorn, and a couple more people who should be guests on the show. Um, and went to Boulder for a few days and basically just spent time like hanging out with those guys talking about, you know, everyone's businesses is kind of similar sizes, similar challenges, similar opportunities. And mm. we started doing this a couple times a year. It was really fun. And that's how I knew Walter was running because he was very, he's like, I can't walk everybody. Like he's like, <laughs> he's, he's going to extreme lengths to make sure he's like not overusing his legs. Protect, protect your legs. We're like, do you want to walk this like 25 minute thing to dinner? He's like, no. I won't. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it was it good. was great. Um, and Boulder was fun. It was just it was really good vibes. Um, and yeah, brought it brought me a lot of joy to see those folks in person. Hashtag Boulder with the boys. Boulder with up the with boys. That. Wow, that's hashtag. Should, yeah, that would have gone well. Let's get some <laughs> shirts. Boulder with the boys. What do you guys? Boys think? of Boulder the with... Z. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, I saw the new Trolls movie that's coming out in like 
uh, it's going to come out after this is out. Yeah. This is a movie for children. Yep. Uh, by DreamWorks. Always has popular songs in it. And we saw a preview of it. Yeah. And my daughter Olympia is really into it. And it's all about boy bands. And like InSync is in it. And, you know, mm. InSync's like back together. It's pretty clear they're just back together for Trolls, the new <laughs> Trolls movie. It's the main theme of the movie. And it was very funny to watch it because it's just like boy band uh, jokes, like all throughout stories about boy bands. Like, love it. The, 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 the singles are boy band, new singles from InSync. It was, it was actually, <laughs> it, was, it was a delight. It really brought me back to the, to the early aughts, you know? Yeah, that's that's the time to be musically, you know. It's isn't don't they say whatever you were listening to when you're like eighteen to twenty three, like that's it. That's the best that's it. you'll ever get. That's the best it'll ever be for you. Wow. Do you agree with that? I don't, but it 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 definitely occupies a special space in my heart. It's kind of like you don't know what type of music you're going to connect with. You don't know across your journey. I smell uh, a transition coming. You don't know. <laughs> it's hard to know what's going to work, but you, when it when you really connect to something, mm. you're going to know what it. You, it's, it feels really It'll special. Feel different. It feels, you feel different. Uh, it's almost like the journey of building a product. Um, and it's it's hard to know the stuff that's going to resonate. This is this is not going to. I don't know. Did I get it? I doesn't no. feel like I did. This you is did not get this. This is the song. worst transition I've ever done for so a, just an incredible interview with Jeff. Yeah. So I, I feel like we should just. He doesn't like, deserve this. He doesn't let's, deserve this. But we'll stop. leave it in and let's cut to that interview with Jeff. <laughs> Jeff, so good to have you on the show. Thanks for coming on. Super excited to chat with y'all. Yeah, really, really excited that you're here. It's gonna be a great episode. Um, as you know, our podcast is called Talking Too Loud because when I get excited, I cannot control the volume of my voice. It was happening just as I was explaining to you the basics of the show before we started recording. So it is real. It is what happens. But we love to start the show by asking our guests what has them talking too loud. So what has you talking too loud these days? I always talk too loud when I talk about um, long distance running. Uh, okay. Which, mm. which with the New York Marathon was this weekend. It was so all good. super exciting. Favorite day Perfect of the weather. year. Yeah, absolutely. Did you so, run it? Wait, did you run? Uh, I ran last year. This year, just work, work kind of went in the way. Uh, but and we'll get into that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, the 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 idea of going out in the wild, mostly trail running, um, trying to um, tune in with yourself, trying to uh, craft a trail through wilderness, and having a lot of time uh, with your own thoughts is is super meditative and and um, has been a big part of of uh, what I do outside of work and how I stay sane. Do you do you listen to music when you run, or are you silent? What do you do? You're just with your thoughts. <laughs> a lot, of, a lot of it is silent. Yeah, wow. um, uh, uh, mostly because like your phone will die <laughs> if, if you. <laughs> <laughs> Very That's, true. Oh, it's a technology limitation. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, I mean the goal. The goal is really to it's 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 really meditative um, and. Um, it's funny, like I have a lot of energy when I moved to SF, I'm back in New York now, but when I moved to SF, it was like, where, where do people spend their energy? And everyone was like nature hiking. And so yeah. you kind of get into that. And then fi like creating your own trails. Like you're mm -hmm. just like literally out there running through the wilderness. Look like, I'm like, this looks good. Like, I hope I get back. Is that the approach? What's the approach? Yeah. I mean, essentially when you think about your world, it's like a two dimensional plane and and we'll use strava to basically map out different 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 paths um for example like once we we you know uh, went from you know point reyes all the way back to san francisco through through different oh. trails we went through zion park we did um the crossing of grand canyon um a lot of different like group type of uh, experiences that um are kind of off the beaten path and um obviously you get in a lot of trouble throughout uh which which is always <laughs> always fun and it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of a good, a good, um, metaphor for kind of building company. You kind of know where you're, where you're trying to get to. Everything looks much easier on paper. And then you get there and there's a massive mountain facing you with no water <laughs> and you have to kind of be agile and, and, and be flexible and have, have a team behind you to support you. Yeah. That, I mean, that's you, you got, read, that. I was you read make our that, minds. I was going to make that transition myself. I was so going to tell you to make beautiful. it. So yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so let's get into that. So you're the VP of product at Ramp. The company was founded in 2019. You joined in 2020, I think, if my information is correct. And you guys have been one of the fastest growing SaaS companies of all time. You're trying to create that 
path for like what you should build and what the company will become. What has that journey been like? Uh, awesome, intense, scary, emotional, uh, rewarding, um, and you know, huge, huge growth story for me personally. Um, you know, I, I kind of came in as almost a, a nobody, and now I'm, I'm, I'm in different podcasts. Whatever that means. Uh, <laughs> You're a podcast guy now. It means you've made it. You've <laughs> made podcast it. Guy. You find, you've made it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but it's it's, fu it's funny how fast you go from you know listening to podcasts and taking notes to people reaching out to you and, and wanting to ask for your advice and and, and honestly, um, a lot of it is is timing and 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 luck. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been an incredible journey. Um, the, the 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 team has grown. I think I joined. We were about ten folks. We're now close to seven hundred. We just moved into a new office um, in uh, in Manhattan, which is beautiful. And you look around, you're like, "We don't deserve this." Like, let's let's keep on cranking, <laughs> let's keep, let's keep on hacking away. So, uh, still super early days, but yeah, happy to go into any any part of that. I want to talk about like finding product market fit a little bit. Like, you know, th I've, there's been a lot of stuff I've read recently of people trying to describe again what does product market fit feel like because it's so there isn't just like one metric, right? What what did that feel like at the beginning? You know, you joined 10 people, 700 people now, you know, leading the charge on the product. Many, I mean, we're a customer here at Wistia, many different products you've built, right, within the product. But I wanna start at the beginning. Like, what, what, did that, what does that feel like? What are the signs and signals you look for? What is the stuff that tells you you're on the right track versus just being like irrationally working on something? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. So, so for context, like I remember, I came into the office the first day and, and Eric Lyman, the CEO was like, Jeff, you have to figure out when we're actually launching. We were completely in, in a closed beta. We didn't have a website. Um, we had no product. We had, you know, 10 customers that were friends and family testing it out. And, um, and we launched, but the launch itself was just, a, it was a marketing moment. It was a brand moment, but it was definitely not product market fit. <laughs> like we had mm. our app, our credit application was, was a Google sheet. Um, the product was barely working. <laughs> uh, we, we, we struggled, um, to, to, to really find that product market fit for, for many months. And I think for me, when it finally started clicking was when folks that were not in our network started getting interested in our value proposition. It was for, for some period of time is like, I'm looking at these, all these customers and they're all friends of ours that are kind of doing us a favor, which is, which is important by the way, like it, yeah. the bootstrap part is a big, big piece of it. Um, make your investors go to work for you, make your make, cash in those chips, all the, all the, the, the capital you've been building over the years. That's why you, you also have to be kind to others and use their products and help them, uh, because it, you know, that goes around a lot. And I think we found that, that product market fit when. I was sitting in every single demo and every single sales call because that's exactly how you should be building products is just being sitting with sales, not necessarily with engineering, because um, you get all the signal at the sales process. You don't have any existing customers and and you see the the eyes of your your contact like light up when they see something and then you're like, OK, like what what is going on here? What was exciting about that? And you kind of double down and double down and double down. And so for us, you know, one of the biggest biggest features that, that found that product market fit was receipt matching and virtual card issuing to your employees that were remote. Now it was COVID hit, everyone yeah. was remote. And so we build an easy way to request spend for your, your office, uh, uh, and any benefits that you have, um, in a delightful way. And, and that just basically took off from there. So our, our growth was, you know, very, very, very low for, for three months after launch. And then really started cascading, and and the feeling is is one of, um, a lot of of calls and demos, um, and you start to get like a lot of that conversion from those demos into into the sales sales process and and into the into the product, and then you start basically building the the followers, folks advocating for you, folks being delighted. We have a bunch of surveys that are running in our product that are constantly measuring um, customer satisfaction. Um, so you find that product market fit in one specific segment. Let's be real. Like we did not have product market fit that we have today in one specific product and you scale from there. 
you didn't know what the features that you didn't know what this was going to look like right in terms of like you're in these demos you're building these features and then you're showing receipt matching automatically done right which is like you can text a receipt you can forward an email and it just matches it to the expense and people are like oh shit that's awesome is that really like like or or did you think that you had that pl that path was figured out do you know you were in strava planning the path is that and you thought this is the one like i'm i'm just really yeah. interested in those exact moments because i yeah. think it's so when people are building something or building something new, it's almost impossible to know what the thing is going to be because the market's constantly moving. If it wasn't, maybe you could like go and interview people and then a year later deliver them something. But it doesn't it doesn't work like that anymore. So, yeah, just tell me about that. Like, did yeah. you did you know on the path that this was going to be the thing? We, we had no idea. Um, and, and, and I think there's an important distinction to be made. Founders pitch. VCs. So they have a vision for their company and they try to pitch the customer the same vision. And it, it, it actually doesn't work that well. <laughs> like the customer doesn't care about your company. Uh, they, and, and the bigger vision that you have in, in five years, they care about their meeting pay points. And so we, we had to have like a very consultative approach. I mean, I, 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 my first job was out of college was, was consulting. We would go to the customer's office. This was pre COVID. And we had like a slide slide presentation on like, here's all, here's the ROI of our product. Here's all the things we could do for you. We would like analyze their transactions, try to find savings for them. And like, they would be like, okay, like this is great. But like, that's not really what I want. <laughs> what I want is like, I just want my employees to love my team. I want my employees to spend less time doing expenses. I want them to be empowered and I want them to crank and do work so I can build my company. So our initial hypothesis of like, hey, we're gonna save you a ton of money was actually for the vision and marketing, but the product market fit happened when we really focused on those pain points. So yeah, there was a bunch of pivots along the way. Um, and I think like the high velocity shipping enabled us to pivot very quickly. And do you think this is why, like, I want to go another, even another layer deeper because you're talking, I, and it's resonating what you're talking about. I mean, we went through a big, we've been going through a big strategic shift at Wiston in the last three years. And first it was just like, here's the vision of this all in one platform and it's going to do all these things for you. And like, this is why we're going to save all these time. And everyone's like, cool. And then the customer's like, but do you have this feature? Do you have this other like, specific feature? Like for me, you know, we went from like one product for a very long time to now multiple in one platform. It's been like, it's kind of like smacks you in the face, right? It's like, oh shit, like that vision is not enough. Like they might even think it's cool. They might be nodding their head, but it's not, it's, it's not gonna change the decision-making day to day. Is that why, um, how do I say this? Like there aren't as many Steve Jobs anymore with just like the visionary product. And then they just tell everyone, this is what it's gonna be. And because if you actually go do it, you're not actually, you're not gonna find the features. You're not gonna find the pain points or the specific jobs to be done that mm -hmm. actually get product market fit? I think, I think it's very hard in like a VC backed environment in a very competitive environment to like get the next Apple. And be, because like, when you think about like Steve Jobs and, and, and Apple, like they, they did a, a ton of investment in R and D before, yeah. before shipping, you know, the, the iPhone, yeah. <laughs> yeah. we got funding six months later, we were live. Six months after yeah. that, we had we had revenue. Yeah. Like it's it's not like you can build the iPhone in that time. They had to have huge verticalization of everything from from the design and manufacturing and the chips all the way to the the software all the way to the distribution. So like, you know, that takes a long time. And I think I think the environment today prevents prevents that from happening. Where you have like pretty impatient pretty impatient investors, um, especially in the software side. Uh, but hopefully with once you find that product market fit you can start actually investing into uh the areas that 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 will enable you to reach that vision i mean none of the none of the companies the big companies out there today started off as 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 those companies i was looking at like you know workday is a pretty big big hitter in the enterprise space i was i was looking at their website from 2005 and it was like we're gonna build like just just b2b applications for for enterprises uh, focused on on payroll, and now they're they're a pretty huge ERP and and you know seven billion dollars of revenue. So things compound over time. Um, uh, yeah, and I'm I'm excited for that future. 
do you is it the same when you're launching new products within a platform or in a suite or what have you is product market fit the same does it feel the same is it always the same or is it different when you have like you know existing customers already using something it's it's very different um i feel like secondary products have benefits but also like um also disadvantages the benefit is that like you have a an engaged user base that you can tap into and sell so like your immediate once you launch that first that second product like your growth is very very fast to call it five percent ten percent penetration or we call it attach rate the disadvantage is that you don't have to stand on your own because you're you're part of this platform and so your value prop is consolidation right um and so you kind of sometimes let off the gas in terms of like how amazing those secondary products are and they feel like kind of you know second class citizens in the organization um and so it's 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 tough in those regards but we we basically try to get to like 40 50 percent attach rates with our secondary products and then we ask ourselves at what point do those secondary products become the new wedges that we can go to market at, uh with um and I think that right now, especially in the fintech space, we do see consolidation as a big value prop. And so um, we're not yet there. But like, for example, we launched our, our bill pay product. Um, it's moving you know, billions of dollars a year, but we're not just like competing against bill.com standalone as just like ramp bill pay versus bill.com bill pay. We sell the actual consolidation play. And I think, I think that's gonna work for a portion of the market for quite some time. And so you're saying like in that case, you're locking, launching a secondary product. You, you can get more traction than you should basically as an independent point solution. So it's very hard to compete with other point solutions on these, you know, ver in these vectors, right? That's exactly right. And you have to think about like, you have to, that, that's the advantage that you have. And so you, you, you really have to think about like, what are the synergies between what I have and what customers want that enables me to build a product that's less good because I have less resources uh, but can, but we can win due to the consolidation play. And so for us, those synergies were like, well, we have money movement, we have identity, we have risk management, we have workflows and permissioning. So it makes total sense to go f between like, I'm paying an employee back to I'm paying a company back. Um, and I think that enables you to, uh, you have to be careful, like which metrics you're optimizing for. But for us, it was win rate, um, for companies that are looking for consolidation. Um, less so LTV uh, expansion. We actually were, were, we're actually more curious about net retention, which is the more products that people use, yeah. the, the more retention you have over time. Yeah. Um, and so just have like a North Star goal for those secondary products so that they don't feel like they need to like be standalone businesses. They never will be. That's interesting. So you're saying we, specifically for people who want to consolidate, you said we want win rate to be super high for that. So, and then we're not going to worry about the other stuff yet. Like that's like the first goal. Correct. It was like yeah. building more capabilities to sell our cash cow, which is, yeah. which is ultimately card and interchange. Okay. What advice do you have for PMs working with a CEO who doesn't get everything we we're just talking about? Like what, what should they do? Like if they, if the CEO wants to be super controlling, dictate what's being built, giving a lot of feedback, what should, what should a great PM do? Mm. What should a head of product do? Yeah. First nice off, one. nice like, one. That that came off his dome. We didn't <laughs> we didn't plan that one. There's no prep for that. No. <laughs> First off, like you gotta understand, like the CEO, it's their company, um, and you work for them. Um, so, like, understand how they think, and start thinking. Start trying to predict what they will say. I think that's like the main thing when you're trying to like level up your skill set is like, what would my boss think and say. Because the more you can do that, and more you can prove to your boss that you think the way they think, the more trust they'll have in your decision process. Um, and so I just had to like really get into the heads of, in this case, it was it was Kareem, the the, the other co-founder that was much more involved in the product. Um, the second thing is, like, it's very scary to like give the reins to this like nobody that that didn't found the company and. And, There's and nobody. And, <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, who the hell is this guy, Jeff? Does he know anything? <laughs> so, so I think, I think, I think you, you know, trust is built through visibility, um, and trust is built through collaboration. And so what I did, I made it a point every week. I would give a summary of exactly what we did. I would give key decision points that I've made. 
I would escalate the decision points that I want them to vet. And um, I shared the framework by which I made those decisions. And, you know, there was essentially just uh, trust around, okay, if there's a key decision that needs to be, that needs to happen, I trust that my employee will, will show that, show me that, that decision and will give me f space for it. And I just made it very clear how I thought and what I was working on and what the team was working on. I think that what, what happened with Ramp is like we found product market fit so quickly that Eric was just fully focused on what he's incredible at, which is the vision, the marketing, the press, the relationship with investors, um, the sales organization, making sure that they, they're, they're humming. Um, and so there was less of that conflict. But I think if it took us longer to find that product market fit, I'm sure <laughs> there would have been a little bit more friction. Um, and then our, our CTO, uh, Kareem was all focused on talent acquisition. So there was actually very little people really thinking about the day-to-day -day product decisions, unlike other CEOs that I've seen out there. And that's great. That means that, you know, people are actually, their, their skill sets are being complementary. So if, if your CEO is spending a lot of time really nitpicking the product, also think about, Hey, what's the highest leverage thing that you should do now that I'm here and how can you actually expand your scope? You might be really good at product. But you're the CEO now, um, and I'm here. So how, how, how can I help you do other things um, like culture, like process, like vision, like recruiting, um, like branding, like partnerships, all the things that I as a PM can't do. Um, that's another way of like kind of flipping, flipping the script a little bit. How did you know that you should give those weekly reports and like, you know, list the decisions and elevate. Cause obviously as I hear that, you know, there's a, there's something that I, I've learned over the years, which is basically if you, if people know that they're going to have the right moment to give input, ask questions, it reduces so much stress, like for everybody in many different cases, like, um, but how, how did you know to do that? How did you know that this was the move? Cause it's out to me, that seems like a very specific, very tactical thing someone could do if they're in any, I mean, honestly, in any role, um, it could be a PM role, but it could be, you could be the head of marketing. You could be the head of support. It could be doing this and that would be helpful. How did you figure that out? Well, one is like, again, I, I, I kind of grew up in consulting where like you, you just had to, <laughs> um, two is I didn't want to make those decisions alone. Like if I'm, if I'm making those decisions alone and they're the wrong decisions then I'm on the hook. And I should just move on. It, but if we made it together, we're on the same team and you back me up. Um, and the third is like, it helps you make better decisions. Uh, so a lot of times I, I, you know, a lot of, a lot of folks, especially folks that, that are, 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 you know, are very self starters. Um, they don't know how to actually collaborate as effectively. Uh, they see meetings as a way to like, that's slowing me down. You're disempowering me. Um, I'm calling all the shots. But in fact, um, if you actually know how to manage up, if you know how to, how to clearly communicate, which by the way, helps you think clearer too, like the ability to synthesize information and decisions in an executive setting helps you be better. If you know how to do that, um, you're, you're going to be able to de-risk things. You're going to be able to get way more input and you're actually going to move faster, uh, rather than you ship something. No one has any visibility. CEO comes in and be like, what the hell just happened? What is this thing? Immediate, immediate thing stops. And there's a, also a huge waste of time and demoralizing for the team. Um, so I, yeah, I, th I think we don't teach upward, upward management uh, no. skills enough. And I see it on my team too, where I have killers that know how to do their job, but they don't know how to use me. Um, and it's been, it's been a big uh, challenge as you scale a product organization where like 20 PMs or so about how to actually set those boundaries, set those rules so we can scale decision-making and risk management accordingly. It's really interesting because the, what, uh, first of all, I could, uh, everything you're saying, I love so much. I think aggressive that aggressive nodding is happening. Aggressive nodding throughout. Like, I think just the idea of, well, you're not just making these decisions by yourself. You want to have other people back you up. You need trust and alignment, right? Is what you need, but it gets confusing because to go fast, don't you need empowered teams? So how do you do it? Or, and I, even last week I was at this, um, I was with like five other, um, entrepreneurs and CEOs and we were talking about the link between like empowered doesn't mean autonomous and that like, it, it's like an empowered, highly aligned, incredible empowered, not aligned. It's risky. Like you're, you know, can you talk about that? Cause I feel like there's so much discussion about 
empowered teams and what that means. And how do you make that work? Like, how do you get the speed benefit? You know, we haven't talked that much about speed, but I know you're all about speed. Ramp is all about speed. Like, how do you get the speed benefit and keep the alignment so that um, you really can move fast, but go in the right direction? Yeah. That's the million dollar question. So, so here, <laughs> here are like some, some guidelines that we put at, at ramp at, at, at our stage, which, which might be helpful at earlier stages too. First off, align, like make sure you're aligned on the goal, not the, it's like the point in the map, not the path to get there. Okay. The point in the map, where are we going? Like in a quarter, where do we want to be? from a, a qualitative standpoint, from a quantitative standpoint, make sure you're aligned in the direction. Because if you're not aligned in the direction, then like everything kind of falls from there. Then just align on what are like the one-way doors that I want to be looped in on? What do I care? You have to communicate what you care about. And for the thing that for me, what I care about is like contracts. It's um, releases to, the, to all our customers. So I, I come in when... You can ship whatever you want to our beta customers. That's what they signed up for. They're like, I, w I love your product. We'll test anything you want. Great. But you roll this out to 100% of our users now that we have you know, close to 20,000 businesses. Like, I, I, I'm going to stress test this thing. And then lastly, anything that touches like risk or money movement, which are like extremely critical systems. Um, so make those boundaries, make those boundaries um, very clear. And then lastly, like give an incentive for people to want to manage up to you. Like, um, what was it? It was, uh, uh, you know, Disney that had like this, like, like group of people that, that, that would review, um, any movies or any scripts and, and people, people cherished that people, people wanted that. So, so make, make the engagement process delightful. And the way to do that is always start with praise, right? Always start with like, I love this effort. This is fantastic. Here's what I like about this. And then like constructive or questioning remarks, oftentimes people are scared, right? Of the executive team. They think they don't have the context. They think that they're slowing them down. Just prove them that you actually are able to, to move faster. Hey, like, let me get you more resources. Hey, let me, let me unblock you on these different areas. And then just iterating. I think the, the other piece too, is when I have a new PM on my team, I basically say like, look, I'm going to, I'm going to micromanage you for the first three months. We're going to like, we're going to learn how to work together. I'm going to be in the room for most of the things that you do. And then we're going to slowly like separate away and it's going to be more, a much more fluid interaction for where you're going to learn how to work with me and I'm going to work, like, work with you and different P I work with different PMs in very different ways. Some PMs I'm like, I fully trust your data analytics skills. I'm not going to review your model, but you're really bad at UX. So I'm going to like spend way more time on that. And I want you and me to spend more time on that. I love that. And there's something in there that you said that I hope people take away. And I'm, I'm just hitting this in case someone's not hearing it, which is like, you're obviously having conversations with these folks about what their weaknesses are and like, you're still hiring them. You're still trusting them. You're still giving them the teams to run. And you're saying like, I want you to do this. There's a gap over here. Let's work on it. And that's really important because everybody has some weakness. Everyone has something they haven't done before. Everyone has something that they can do better at. Right. Um, and what I think I, I've seen managers do, especially first time managers, sometimes will do this is they'll hire someone. They think their job is like, send them in the direction, send them in the direction. They don't spend that time up front to really get aligned. And then they end up, you know, six months later being like, this person isn't working. Oh God, what do I do? What do I do? And it's like, oh, they have some gap. Like, oh God, like versus like addressing it up front and, and actually like staying close to them. And so to, it's just like, I really hope that if you're listening, you're watching, you're thinking about this, like what Jeff's describing here is a way to have a much more open, more feedback, rich relationship with someone who reports to you. Yeah. And, and Chris, I want to underline one more thing, which is like, you should not have one management style. You need to manage people yes. the way that they need to be managed. Yes. And, um, you know, just like a product in the market, you got to find product market fit. You got to have man you got to have your management style to manage e-fit. And I manage everyone on my team extremely differently. Um, the, the last thing I'll say is like the, the best way to also make sure that you, you have uh, teams that can move forward is like, nothing is actually binding. Um, like they can go and do things. They just can take the risk. Right. Um, and, and that's just kind of the contract as well as we build fully in the open. So I actually spend most of my day reading, 
Um, I just spend time reading. I read everything, every single spec, every single design, every single document. That enables me to just like actually have the context, know where people's skills are, because like their actual work product enables me to see deep inside their skill set. But I also just tie, tie the tie things together to actually enable people to move faster. So, um, yeah, make sure that you have an open culture uh, of communication, which which COVID has like forced us to have. Um, I think siloed information sometimes leads to you not having visibility into the team's actual performance. Yeah, I love that. And it, it's, um, it's interesting because even on the being open about how you're going to manage somebody or you're going to manage people differently, I think it's like part of the, it could be part of the interview process too, is like asking people what type of work environment they're looking for and how they do their best work. And like, at least in my experience, I do, I do that with people that I'm hiring. And there's sometimes there are people who like their work style is the opposite and you don't realize it. And like, they're not going to have a great time and you're not going to have a great time. It's like, it's much better to address that actually in the interview process than it is to not address it, not deal with it, or assume like, this is just how I work. Like you need to sign up to understand people are at different places of things. Like it's like there's there's really great, um, uh, book on delegation and it talks about I'm blanking on the name of it right now, but it talks about, um, how there's some people who's like, I want you to go build this thing. I want you to go do this thing. You just tell me the end result. And that's the only way that if they, if they have all the skills, they understand how to do it, they can do it. There's other people who's like, I want you to go build this thing. I'm going to sit down with you. We're going to do the first version. We're going to do the second version. We're going to do the third version. Okay. And then there's, and there's people who will will hate to have you do the first version with them, but would love the feedback after that. And it's like people need different forms of delegation, even for the same person needs it sometimes for different types of tasks. And that when you, when you get there, it works, but when you don't, it's a, uh, um, there's just a lot of confusion, I think around like, why am I hiring these people that seem so great? And they're not working or why are these two people not working together? All that kind of stuff. Okay. This wouldn't be an interview about building products and moving fast food and talk about AI, obviously. So um, AI is coming rapidly. It is changing dramatically. The open AI dev day just was a few days ago. How are you thinking about AI at ramp? There's been a lot of, you know, hype cycles over the last like five years. I remember we had we had a, like a jam session on should we do crypto? What should we do with crypto? And I was always like, uh, this is all hype. AI is one of those things where I'm like, this is absolutely not hype. This is this is the future. Um, we use it heavily, and and I think it's important to call out that like you know the, the 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 innovation that's happening right now really is around like large language models, which 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 are perfect for what Ramp is doing. And so you have you have to understand the technology, uh, and I'm definitely not an expert here, um, and the application of that technology. So when you think about you know what finance teams do, a lot of it is around the understanding of, of words. Um, you get a contract. What are the terms? You get a receipt. Did it match the transaction? You get an invoice. What are, what, when, what do I have to pay? Um, and it like LLMs enable you to do that incredibly well. Um, so we've, you know, we've acquired a company full of, of ex ramp engineers that had started a company that we then acquired, <laughs> um, that's going to happen a lot, uh, um, that are, that are experts in, in the AI space and, and are, they're basically building a, a ton of AI products to, to essentially just remove and eliminate a lot of the manual work that, that finance teams do. And so I think, I think software is going to look different. I think software is going to be much more like conversational. And flexible, a lot of software right now is like user interfaces, like drop downs and tables and all these things. But like, what actually are you trying to do? And we'll do it for you. As well as like a lot of the workforce is very operational. And I think that headcount is going to go away. Um, finance teams are going to be much more lean, much more strategic. Um, those folks will need to get reeducated in terms of, of how to use AI to do their jobs. And I think the margin is going to be um, or the, just the, the economic value is going to be just fully owned by SaaS. I think that software is going to have like a lot more revenue um, because it's not just going to be the UI that your teams use, but actually a lot of the operational functions that your teams use. So um, I'm excited for that future. I hope that we we can retrain um, uh, folks to to use AI so they don't get displaced. And I'm excited to to spend way less time doing things that that LMs can do and way more time 
you know, running, running your business, which is kind of what we're about. Love that. Okay. We're going to do a rapid fire section now. So just a few questions, <laughs> short response, whatever comes to mind. Ready? Yeah. Okay. What's the best advice that someone's ever given you? Um, to hire the best people, just ask the smartest people, you know, who is their smartest friend. Good tip. I like it. Um, if you could trade places with anyone for a day, who would it be and why? Oh. <laughs> maybe maybe uh, going down the trail running side, I'll, I'll trade places with like uh, Killian, who's like one of the best trail runners in the world and see what it's like to just run up a mountain without without breathing. But maybe that's a lame <laughs> answer. Uh, and no. how would they do it? That would be, I mean, that's that sounds awesome. cool. But also like, how would they do your job? <laughs> or how would he feel trail running as you that's the question i guess they'll just they'll just bring the, the the momentum the energy and just run around the office telling people go 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 which is exactly what i do so it's fine <laughs> um name something you're low-key good at out outside of work i guess like like home construction like i i i, I uh you guys maybe can see my i have like this door oh look at that oh whoa door. nice did yeah. you break a cup did that uh, just happen too maybe a va maybe a vase <laughs> <laughs> but i can fix it you see yeah oh. all right. uh, that you, you just are so cool at that um <laughs> anything anything with my hands we don't use our hands enough <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's amazing <sighs> um what's your go-to karaoke song enrique iglesias <laughs> uh uh, I could be your hero, which is fantastic as a as a duet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Put that putting that on the list for next time. And what's your favorite meal of the day? Breakfast, lunch, or dinner? Lunch, because I I skip breakfast, so I'm starving. Um, and yeah, din dinner is always. Uh, you 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 work you work so intensely that you just forget to eat dinner sometimes. But yeah, <laughs> lunch, is, lunch is lunch great. it is lunch. Um, Jeff, thank you so much for coming on the show. Where can people best connect with you to learn more, follow your journey? Uh, Twitter, it's, it's Jeff in tech, um, uh, LinkedIn, although, um, I feel like just everyone just tries to connect with you without saying why they want to connect with There's you. There's a lot so. of that. Like you need the why guys. He wants the why. Me, Tell give, him the why. Give me, give me the why. <laughs> I want to expand my professional network. Um, <laughs> Yeah, just give, give me give me some give me some some value, some insights to see who you are. Wow, that was a lot of actionable stuff. There's a lot of advice. A you lot can take of tasty from this. nuggets in here. Yes. A lot of tasty nuggets, like basically how to manage up, why that's important, alignment versus empowerment. I mean, what it feels like to get product market fit. You know what? Um, yeah, Sorry to it was just, that was just flow. really cool. Yeah. Something he said that I don't think I've heard other product people talk about, and I'm curious when we have other product folks on the show, maybe we should ask, but he was saying that he spent a lot of time on sales calls because mm -hmm. that's where he was getting the signal from. And I just wonder, I don't know, I wonder about that. I feel like April kind of talked about that a little bit when she came on that like, yep sales needs to be more in step with product and yep. vice versa. But it seems like if there's less time for everyone to spend on R and D and you have to go fast, that that relationship would be really important. Yes. When he said that, that jumped out to me too, because it's really this idea of like, all right, you have this long-term vision, but what he's saying is you need the stuff to work now. So if you mm -hmm. need it to work now, what are the exact features? What are the things? And you don't know what's going to connect. And it's literally the look on their face yeah. that you're looking for. Right. Which, which is funny. I like was catching up when we were in Austin with one of the founders of Jasper. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about that same thing that when they first were showing um, customers the first version of the product, it was literally their facial reactions that told them they were onto something. Yeah. It's so, and, yeah. yeah. It's just, but it's also, it's like, I just think about this all the time, especially in tech and the numbers are so big, right? You know, millions of users here, tens of thousands of users here, that what we're really talking about is a human being behind that look, like being delighted, saving, doing something they couldn't do before, saving a bunch of time, or he's talking about the AI stuff. It's like, hey, there's all this work that I have to do that eventually I won't have to do. 
and I can do other things. The delight, the feeling, the feelings are real in there. And it's like zeroing in on that is actually what gives you the guidance faster to figure out the path. Um, but if you're not on those calls or you're just looking at the data, you're just looking at like at usage data, it's so hard to tell what's actually happening. Did you have the usage and they, but they hated it? It was, mm -hmm. it was a bad experience. I won't right. talk about products you and I have used where I've seen <laughs> you get very upset. Um, or is it like a delightful experience? And that's going to be, it help you key into what are the, actually the right strategic moves to take in your business. And it's, it seems so simple, so hard to actually do it. So hard. God, there were just so many. There were so many. There were so many things. This is this is a real like. If you want lessons and tips and advice, this is a great one for listeners and viewers to get in on. Um, you know, yes, product enthusiasts will love this, but I actually think a lot of the a lot of the content that was about managing up, that was about you know like founders pitching VCs one thing, but needing to find a different pitch for customers like this, this one blew my mind. Yeah. It's, and I think for marketing too, it's just like, are you ready to market this thing? Yeah. What part of this is what people really care about. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. I loved it. He was, he was such a great guest. And he broke a vase. He was talking he so vase. loud. Completely he broke a vase. That was our first vase break, vase break, vase break. Vase, vase. Vase, Not vase, sure. vase. Is it vase? Is I it don't Vaz, know. Vaz or Vaz. Vaz or Vaz. Tell us in the comments. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll have a new episode coming up very soon. So make sure you like and subscribe. Um, you know, throw a little review in there. Tell us what, what you want more of. Uh, you can always suggest guests at ttlpod at wistia.com. We've had a lot of great guests suggest to us. Jeff was actually another one of those people. Um, so keep those suggestions coming in. We'll do our best to reach out to folks and make those interviews happen. And if you want to connect with Sylvia and I, you can find us on LinkedIn. You can find us on Twitter. And we'll see you soon.